Good afternoon. My name is Gene Anderson. I'm the Dean of the Whitman School of Management here at Syracuse University. And it's my great pleasure to welcome everyone to this very special speaking event. I want to extend an especially warm welcome to our students and to those members of the broader Syracuse community who are able to join us today. I also wanna thank our partners at SUNY Onondaga Community College and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York for making today's webinar possible. This afternoon's fireside chat will begin in a moment and be moderated by Tom Barkley, Professor of Practice in Finance here at the Whitman School. But first, it is my honor to introduce the best university leader in the country, Syracuse University Chancellor Kent Severud, who will introduce today's speaker. Thank you, thank you, Gene, and thanks for the exaggeration. Uh, it's really my distinct pleasure to welcome uh, John C. Williams, President and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Uh, I am particularly grateful, as is the Whitman School and Gene, to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, to Onondaga Community College and its president, Dr. Casey Crable, and to everybody at the Martin J. Whitman School of Management who helped make this happen, including Dean Anderson and Professor Thomas Barkley and Professor Ravi Shukla. The Federal Reserve Bank of New York is the premier member of the Federal Reserve System, in my humble opinion. Its status is fueled by its location in one of the world's premier financial centers. Most Americans know the Federal Reserve in the context of the Open Market Committee, which sets reference interest rates, which in turn influence capital markets and consumer credit rates for the financial instruments that are part of everybody's everyday life, including mortgages and lines of credit. The Federal Reserve Banks also have a much broader mission. In addition to implementing monetary policy, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York provides important services to the state, to the region, and to foreign governments and central banks. The bank has supervisory and regulatory authority over a wide range of financial institutions in the United States. And the bank serves as a fiscal agent in the United States and provides banking services to about 200 central banks, governments, and international institutions that hold US dollar accounts. And the Federal Reserve Bank in New York also provides community development and educational services, including impartial information that informs decisions in central New York. Um, that's why we're so honored to have President Williams join us at Syracuse University today for a discussion focused on the central New York economy. As the president and chief executive officer of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, he serves as the vice chairman and a permanent member of the Federal Open Market Committee. Previously, he served as the president and chief executive officer of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. Prior to that, he was the executive vice president and director of research at the San Francisco Fed, which he joined in 2002. He began his career in 1994 as an economist at the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System in Washington. In addition, he has served as a senior economist in the White House Council of Economic Advisors and is a lecturer at Stanford University's Graduate School of Business. Mr. Williams holds a PhD in economics from Stanford University, a master's Degree from the London School of Economics and a bachelor's degree from the University of California at Berkeley. His research focuses on monetary policy under uncertainty, business cycles, and innovation, quite relevant today. President Williams, Professor Barkley, thank you for doing this. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Chancellor Severud, for the opportunity uh, to, for you to be here uh, and introduce John. And uh, we just are very grateful that uh, we have this opportunity to hear from someone who knows much about the economy of the whole country, but also takes an interest in our little neck of the woods here in central New York. So I'd like to begin with uh, just some some introductory questions, if I may, about why you're here. If uh, I can begin by just uh, what, what I've surmised is that this event is part of a broader virtual visit by the New York Fed to the Syracuse area, and that you've had a number of meetings with local groups over the last few days. 
what brings you here and why are you focusing on central New York? Uh, well, first of all, thank you for hosting this event. I've been really looking forward to this and, uh, and this uh, fireside chat and discussion. So uh, um, definitely it's a highlight of my day. Um, in terms of why we're here, and it's not just me, I have my uh, a, a team of uh, colleagues with me. Of course, when I say with me and here, I mean virtually. Uh, we're all um, uh, still in a virtual um, world. Uh, but really, I go back to the Federal Reserve system. We have 12 Federal Reserve banks. Uh, the New York Fed is the second Federal Reserve um, District, and we represent uh, the state of New York, uh, northern New Jersey, western Connecticut, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. And part of our job, my job, is to understand what's happening throughout the district, not just New York City, but uh, in upstate New York, central New York for, for this trip, uh, and in Puerto Rico, uh, USVI, and, and elsewhere. And so we have economists who study the regional economy. We have uh, uh, people who work in economic and community development who work with local stakeholders in the communities and business and, and government uh, working on economic development and uh, issues. And we, we also supervise uh, financial institutions uh, in the district. So an important part of my job is to really understand what's happening throughout the district, understand where there are common themes in terms of where the economy is, uh, but also where there are distinct uh, differences uh, in different parts of the district. And then when we get together at, um, you know, with my colleagues for the Open Market Committee, uh, this is part of the input that helps me understand what's happening here and sharing that uh, with my colleagues who also do the same thing, where they're reaching out to all parts of their district. So I think that gives us a really good understanding of uh, the, you know, a very complex economy uh, uh, and understanding all the different uh, aspects of that. So really it's a fact-finding, listening uh, trip um, and, and engaging with uh, various uh, community and economic and uh, other leaders uh, in this region. In light of what you've been hearing from some of these community leaders, what's your view on the Syracuse economy and central New York a little bit more broadly and uh, your, your outlook there? Well, apparently uh, there's a lot of interest in basketball here right now. That's the first thing I've, I definitely <laughs> have heard <laughs> and a lot of excitement. Uh, uh, so that's, a, uh, I would just mention that. Um, the, you know, I, clearly we're still in the middle of the pandemic. And so we've talked to nonprofits, uh, business and, and uh, government officials. Um, and, you know, even though I think people are seeing perhaps uh, a better future with back, the progress in vaccinations, with the fiscal support and other signs that the economy may be starting to turn the corner, that's not where it is now. And, and a lot of businesses are still struggling, uh, have restaurants and others having lost a lot of business. A lot of people are obviously out of work and really struggling there. And, and, and especially the, the uh, communities that were struggling before the pandemic have been hit very hard. So I think that what I've heard a lot in the last two days, and I'm gonna continue this trip tomorrow, is that although you know things are looking up there's still a lot of ways to go until um the this region's economy is back to full strength which is a theme i've heard you know throughout the rest of the the district as well certainly one of the concerns is in terms of employment many people have either been laid off or uh, small businesses have closed temporarily or permanently I was looking recently at a New York State Department of Labor report that came out March 11th, and I was surprised to see that the unemployment rate in New York State outside of New York City dropped to 6.1% in January, so it was even down from uh, December. What do you think are the main reasons for the increase in employment or decrease in unemployment? And what is the Federal Reserve Bank of New York doing to stimulate this increase in uh, the central New York region? Well, I, you know, you're making an important point that we are seeing improvements uh, recently in uh, large parts of, uh, of the country's economy and, and specifically uh, in New York as well. And I think that has been that, you know, the fiscal support that we saw, uh, stimulus checks and uh, more unemployment benefits and uh, support for uh, businesses and, and, and state and local governments. That money has definitely helped people uh, pay bills and 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 meet their um, obligations. And uh, so that's definitely a positive we've seen. As we've also seen, you know, with the COVID cases, as those got 
you know, significantly worse uh, late in the year. That caused the economy to slow quite a bit. And then as the COVID cases have come down and importantly hospitalizations and deaths come down, we've seen people feel a little safer to uh, engage in, in economic activity. Now we're seeing this across the country again. I think the, the you know, you mentioned an unemployment rate above 6% in the country as a whole, it's a little above 6%. That's still well above any sense that, you know, of a strong, uh, healthy economy. Uh, it's a big improvement from, from last spring uh, for sure. Uh, but it's still, we still have quite a ways to go. But it, I think it's just, it's, you know, honestly, it, COVID and vaccinations are really driving a lot of the economy. So when the COVID cases go up, people pull back from economic activity, um, you know, stop uh, going out and, and, and to go to restaurants and shopping and things. Um, and as cases get lower and as we see vaccinations continue to progress, I think we're going to see good uh, improvements in the economy over coming months. Uh, you know, you alluded in your comments just then about the economy as a whole. And when you think about monetary policy for the entire nation, how do you consider regional factors? In particular, uh, you know, the, the economy might be stronger in certain areas and weaker in others. And how do you see that playing out in our region here? Um, yeah, and that's an important part of understanding the economy. I often say that we don't have one economy. We have hundreds or maybe even thousands of economies in our country, both regionally, but also the various sectors. And clearly the pandemic hit certain sectors and continues to hit certain sectors much harder than others. And that's, you know, uh, leisure and hospitality, travel, things like that. Um, and those are the ones that are still, you know, struggling uh, to get back to any sense of, of normal. Um, I, I should also, I do, I do know you asked another question at the end of the last one. So I should also mention what the Fed does do. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we have been since the beginning of the pandemic, um, in, well, the first signs of the pandemic, quite honestly, before the economy was, was actually affected really directly. Um, we've been using all of our monetary policy and other tools that we have uh, um, to try to support the economy, keep credit flowing, uh, lower interest rates um, and take other all the actions we can uh, to support the economy through the pandemic. But I think even much more importantly, to provide uh, monetary accommodation, we say, you know, uh, strong monetary policy support for a robust and full recovery over the next couple of years. So that's really, you know, the priority. And I think uh, when we look at the New York economy, a lot of what we've done, I think, has helped um, you know, both keep credit flowing and, and um, maybe minimize what could have been a much worse situation, but also as the economy, as people start coming back into the economy, uh, our policies hopefully will come, hopefully accelerate that. Now, we're not the only one acting. Obviously, Congress and, and the administration have taken strong actions over the last year to support uh, the economy. And most importantly, it's about the health crisis. It's about, um, you know, keeping COVID under control and, and getting to, you know, place where people feel safe and uh, able to, to get back in the economy. In terms of the, the, the hundreds or the thousands of economies that we have, and how does that go into our thinking about monetary policy? Uh, it, yeah, I think it provides that the richness of understanding what's happening in the labor market, what's happening in terms of uh, economic you know, growth, what's happening in terms of inflation. And so, you know, we you can't use monetary policy to address every single part of the economy. Monetary policy is a national tool. Um, it does allow us to understand kind of the full tapestry, if you will, of what's going on in the economy, where the risks are, uh, where the opportunities are. And a lot of monetary policy is really about risk management. It's not just looking at, I think the economy is going to grow, you know, a certain percent a growth rate, but also understanding what could go right or what could go wrong around that and how do we position ourselves. So I think that, that getting all of that information is important input to understanding where the, you know, where the main drivers of the economy are and also where could things uh, deviate from what we're, we're expecting. Yes, that, uh, I think you, one of your comments that you made just there is about the importance of health in this particular pandemic scenario that we've seen over the past year. It seems like every decade or so, uh, the country faces a crisis of some sort. And many people remember what happened in 2007, 2008, 2009 with the global financial crisis and the Great Recession at that point. How do you compare uh, 
uh, the state of the economy right now with the economy uh, as we saw that great recession in 2008, 2009? You know, it's it's natural to ask that question, and it's a it's a question that I get asked a lot. So I appreciate you asking that. But it's just a completely different uh, type of circumstance uh, with the global financial crisis. It was about weaknesses in the financial system uh, and uh, excessive risk taking the financial system that then spilled over to uh, the the broader economy and led to a terrible recession that took years and years and years to recover from. This is a very different. Um, you know, set of circumstances. First of all, it's a, obviously a pandemic, so it's a, it's not a, it's not a shock to the economy that came from within, but something that has hit us in terms of uh, it's a, you know the health crisis then affecting the economy. So that's why, first and foremost, the policies that matter are the the health policies, and and uh, those are the ones that are going to really determine the pace at which the economy comes back. But the second, I think, really important point is we entered the, the uh, pandemic with a, a very strong economy, with historically low unemployment, high employment, good wage gains in the economy. And so I think our fundamentals were good. Our banking system is, came into this situation much stronger because of the reforms that came out of the financial crisis that really made sure that the banks were really strong and, and had adequate capital and, and liquidity to deal with a, a shock like this. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's... It's not anything, I think, like a normal recession. It's much more like a, it's a shutting down of parts of the economy for safety and, and, and for health reasons. And then as we get past that, you know, we get past the pandemic, we can reopen the economy, go back to doing the things that we all miss, you know, visiting our family and friends, going to, I assume your students <laughs> want to come back into the classroom and, and, and be with, uh, you know, their friends and, and to, um, you know, travel and, and go to restaurants and go to theater and movies and everything that we miss. So I see this as, you know, the pace of the recovery has been uh, incredibly fast uh, until it slowed uh, late last year. I expect the pace of the recovery later this year to be really uh, quite rapid in terms of jobs, in terms of economic growth, like GDP. And I see the t ability to get back to a strong economy, hopefully without too much lasting damage, um, is, uh, is being highly likely uh, over the next uh, couple of years. So I think it's a, it's a very different source of the problem. And you know, we acted aggressively, Congress acted uh, decisively as well. Um, and I think that's helped a lot, but I also think it's just a very different thing. So I think that the pace of recovery is going to, I mean, the severity of the downturn was, was horrible. But the pace of recovery is likely to be much more rapid and, and, and more likely to be complete much earlier than we saw a decade ago. Yes. Uh, uh, you talked about students wanting to get it back into the classroom. I think professors, myself included, want to see students back in the classroom. You know, we miss them as much as they miss us, I think. Uh, well, maybe they don't miss us. Maybe they miss their, their peers, right? But uh, as a professor of students, um, I wanted to bring a question from one of our online MBA students, Ed Washington. Uh, his question is regarding the stimulus that uh, has just been um, launched. So with the recent $1.9 trillion coronavirus relief package and other potential stimulus packages down the road, I don't know if we'll have more, but do you have concerns about increased inflation? And, you know, as part of the Federal Reserve banking system, what steps are planned to make sure that that inflation stays under control? Well, we, you know, I, I'll start with our, what our, our, our goals are in monetary policy. Um, uh, it's very clear from the Federal Reserve Act that we have these uh, dual mandate goals, maximum employment and price stability. So that gets right at the inflation question, whatever. And we have made very clear, the Federal Open Market Committee, with our uh, various statements, uh, that we want to see inflation average 2%, infl uh, a particular inflation gauge uh, um, that's uh, you know collected um, by the government and published every month, that's on average growing 2% a year. Um, and so we're very focused on making sure that, that we keep inflation low and stable. High inflation and volatile inflation is obviously negative, uh, has negative consequences. We haven't seen that in a long time, thankfully, but we wouldn't want to see that. Uh, at the same time, for the past decade, the problem has actually been low inflation, where inflation has been below our 2% goal for most of the um, past 10 years. 
And with the uh, global um, downturn from the pandemic, inflation rates around most, in most countries in the, around the world are actually much lower uh, than uh, the central banks like the Fed are seeking. So right now, our problem is actually a little bit low inflation. Inflation is running about one and a half percent right now, and, and we want two percent. And the economy is still, you know, technically we're still in a downturn um, in the sense that, you know, unemployment is still very high. Employment, you know, we're still about nine million jobs lower than we were a year ago in the U.S. economy. So I think that that's going to keep inflation pressures pretty low uh, for some time. I also think globally, um, the rest of the world, outside of China, China's economy has recovered very rapidly. But in most countries in the world, they're actually lagging behind us in the recovery, partly because they haven't been getting the fiscal stimulus that we're getting, but also they're, they're, they're uh, more challenged about around vaccination progress. We've seen that in Europe. We've seen it in South America and other parts of the world. So I see the US economy uh, recovering really nicely over the next couple of years. I see us shrinking um, this uh, uh, shortfalls of uh, our full maximum employment goal, in which I'm really, uh, you know, that's an important goal for us. I don't see inflationary pressures really building uh, during that time, because again, I think in the global context, there's still disinflationary pressures. Um, the economy still won't be at full strength for quite some time. Now, to answer the question, clearly we have a goal of maximum employment and price stability. If we saw an undesirable levels of inflation, per, they are persistent and moving well away from that 2% goal uh, that we thought was inconsistent with our achievement of our dual goals. And we, we have the tools to use monetary policy uh, to, um, to keep inflation near, near that goal. So that's really about eventually um, you know, bringing interest rates and our other monetary policy tools, um, uh, uh, you know, adjusting those to support strong, uh, strong economy, maximum employment, but making sure that inflation stays uh, uh, at levels consistent with what we're, we're seeking. Uh, you talked about the dual mandate, and my previous question was about inflation, uh, sort of trying to keep inflation at the 2% or maybe just just letting it uh, creep a little bit above 2% to make up for the, the lack of growth over the past uh, decade or so. What about going back to uh, the employment side of things? Um, as the economy continues to improve, we still have a lot of unemployed people throughout the country, a lot of unemployed people in upstate New York, a lot of unemployed people in uh, downstate New York, in, in New York City. What level of unemployment rate do you think the Fed would feel comfortable with to say that it had achieved its goals of bringing unemployment back down? Well, you know, that's a Another great question. I, uh, we've often thought about this, uh, you know, as economists and, and as policymakers, what's the level of employment that's consistent with this maximum employment? And of course, there is no rule book or statistic. You know, you can't go into the, to the national income accounts or the employment re uh, report and say, here's the maximum employment level. That doesn't, doesn't exist. So we have to use a judgment. We have to use, you know, observations around you know, what level of employment is consistent with the price stability goal itself. So the two are supporting each other, not inconsistent. So it's, there is no, uh, I don't have a clear number to answer, but I will tell you how I think about it. Um, so one is that when we put out our new monetary policy framework last August, we really emphasize that this is about maximum employment, that we're not worried that somehow that if employment were higher than that, the economy were even stronger than that, that that would worry us unless it was associated with uh, undesirably high inflation um, or another a problem that with achieving our max, uh, dual uh, mandate goals. So we really are saying maximum employment means maximum employment. It's not like some kind of uh, speed limit where you don't want to go beyond that, uh, unless, of course, it would create uh, uh, interfere with the achievement of the price stability objective. So I think that's an important uh, uh, takeaway from that. The second is it's just very hard to know in an economy like ours, it's dynamic open to international, um, you know, global factors. Uh, and again, there is no uh, rule book for exactly what maximum employment is to know with any precision what that, what that number would be and whether that's changed over time. One thing I think we've learned from the past 10 years though is that the unemployment rate itself, the, you know, what we call the U3 uh, unemployment rate, the standard one that you see in the headlines is not an ad adequate measure uh, of what's happening in the labor market. 
there are other factors that are happening, like labor force participation, which is very low right now, uh, in particular as uh, as parents and especially uh, mothers are staying out of work because of the lack of childcare, because schools or uh, May schools are still closed. That a lot of people are not unemployed, but they're actually just not in the labor force. We also see um, you know times where part time employment is very high when people want full time jobs. So we have to look at a broad range of statistics, not just the unemployment rate. Um, but look at a lot of other things around participation, around um, hours worked and other measures of underemployment, and also get that whole range across the country. So I don't have a, a specific answer. I do have a bit of a marker in my, my um, kind of thinking. We had unemployment, uh, going back to the unemployment rate, uh, we had an unemployment rate of three and a half percent before the pandemic hit. We had a employment to population ratio, which adjusts for this labor force participation angle uh, or aspect, and that was a little over 61%. So 61% of the pop, uh, adult population was employed. So I think of those as, as good starting points to think that we this economy, we didn't create inflation uh, that was uh, worrisome. Uh, with an unemployment rate of three and a half and a, a employment of population, I almost went to my acronym EPOP, which is what we call it, uh, of 61 or a little above. That seems uh, clearly uh, markers that we should we should meet uh, or surpass uh, in thinking about maximum employment based on what I know now. But of course, as we watch the economy improve and over the next you know, a couple of years, we'll be also looking at what's happening with wages and, and inflation and a wide range of metrics. But I guess my answer is we know from a couple of year, from a year ago that a three and a half percent employment rate is clearly consistent with our uh, maximum employment, a strong economy. So that would definitely be something I want to see us uh, get back to. Thank you. Uh, indeed, uh, it seems like that that would certainly be a good rate um, uh, if we if we could resume activities at the level that they were at prior to the pandemic beginning. Let me bring another question from another student, an undergraduate student who takes a derivatives class that I teach, uh, Liam Flanagan, to give him credit. When do you think the Federal Open Market Committee will raise interest rates? Now, I have a question. So you said this is a student of yours. So what, what probability does, uh, do your students assign to me answering that question? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, that, 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 is, that is a fair question, and so, I, I don't know. <laughs> so I'm obviously not going to answer that question for a couple reasons. One is I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. when we will take a next uh, policy action because it will be driven by what happens in the economy. Another aspect of our, um, uh, of our policy strategy that, uh, that you know, we're following uh, and have been uh, you know, for some time is really uh, think about monetary policy in terms of the outcomes we desire. So we, we say maximum employment and price stability. So price stability is this 2% inflation rate. So our, our long run uh, goals and monetary policy strategy document that I referred to that we rolled out last year, the, the new version, really emphasizes that it's about achieving those consistently over time. Um, and then when we've, uh, you know, uh, 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 carried out monetary policy since the pandemic, we've really anchored our our communications around the future path of policy around the achievement of, of those goals. And, and you mentioned uh, this notion of not only achieving uh, the 2% inflation, but uh, moderately uh, exceeding that for some, some time and to really to make sure that we've got inflation expectations, inflation anchored at 2%. Similarly, that we wanna see achieving maximum employment rather than you know, have a forecast and someday we'll get there. We, we really want to see that we've achieved uh, levels of the labor market that we think of as consistent with maximum employment. So, you know, because we monetary policy has to be based on the actual data and the forecasts that we do, um, the answer to any question about when we'll take an action or what action that will be, will be driven by what happens in the economy. Uh, right now, we've got interest rates near zero. We're, we're being very uh, active in terms of our asset purchases to keep interest rates low. I think those are put policy in a really good place to help support a very strong, very robust recovery. And to my mind, the most importantly, a full recovery that we'll see happen uh, both in terms of maximum employment, but really achieve this uh, uh, average 2% inflation uh, goal that, that we set out. So I don't have a, a date for that, but I, do, I will say that it will be outcome-based, which means it will be based on what's happening in the economy. And, uh, and the word we always use is when it's appropriate, when it, when it, we think it, you know, taking everything into consideration, we'll adjust policy to do our very best to, you know, keep 
not only achieve our maximum employment, uh, you know, uh, goals, but to, to keep the economy uh, at that, that those goals on a sustained basis. Yes, I, I fully appreciate that and your comments about the appropriateness of making those decisions. Uh, uh, most answers to corporate finance questions that I get asked, uh, the truthful answer is it depends, right? It depends what the circumstances are uh, for a CFO or somebody to make a, a particular decision. Uh, I, I'm, I'm coming to the end of the questions that I have, and shortly I'll transition to some questions from our audience, but a couple more questions that kind of come back, draw things back a little bit to the Syracuse and Central New York region. Um, as we're emerging from the pandemic, what impact do you see on real estate markets in this area? Uh, both retail markets and commercial markets. And if you can comment um, at all, if possible, on the relocation of some businesses from New York City upstate as they found that they can uh, continue to do business, but perhaps at, at lower costs by having lower real estate prices. Yeah, that's a topic that comes up in every single conversation. It's definitely come up with the conversations I've had in my uh, visit here to central New York and, and Syracuse, but it's coming up in every other conversation. I, you know, I'm going to use the answer that you you said, it depends. Or, uh, and I think that is one that business leaders um, are thinking a lot about. You know, what are the opportunities, in, especially in upstate New York? Um, you've got very strong, you know, uh, university education system here, you know, how can you leverage that in a world where maybe people, you know, are more willing to locate um, away from the very biggest cities with a very high cost and, and, uh, or, you know, work virtually. Um, so I think that there's a lot of people thinking hard about how do we, uh, you know, how do we rethink uh, the business model of what we expect in terms of, you know, employees being in, in the office, uh, or is it a hybrid model, or do you allow a remote work? And also, what does it mean for both residential and commercial real estate? There's no question that both locally, and, and I know people know this, but, uh, but, but nationally, we are seeing a significant rise in house prices on the residential side, uh, as people have relocated away from perhaps more densely uh, populated areas uh, to areas uh, with you know, single family homes. We, so we're seeing the housing market uh, quite uh, hot and a lot of construction activity going on. Uh, uh, in, in New York, but around around the country. And I think that is a process of people kind of maybe adjusting in terms of their lifestyle and what they're looking for. And I think on the business side, what I heard that was most interesting was really thinking, you know, thinking about how the lessons of the pandemic, you know, do uh, tell you that you want to have suppliers that maybe are local uh, rather than relying on, you know, global supply chains uh, where transportation was interrupted and challenged even today. You know, there are um, a lot of issues around shipping uh, kind of uh, uh, being clogged at different ports and things like that. So rethinking some of that, that may be, you know, bringing uh, back some of those kind of jobs, but also people thinking about this, this value proposition, you know, uh, for uh, people coming out uh, and living in, you know, in, uh, outside of the major metropolitan areas. So I don't, I, I think it depends. It depends on how businesses adapt to this and, and how people, view what the new normal is. Uh, I think we're all trying to figure that out. Uh, but I do think this is a time for leaders, both business community and um, you know, officials to really be thinking about, well, what is their plan around this for the next five years? Right now there's a housing crunch uh, in a lot of areas. And I know that's true in Syracuse. Um, and uh, to really start thinking about how do you, if, if the new world is one of more virtual employment or hybrid models and people be willing to move back to, um, to cities, uh, other cities, and I think people need to kind of work hard on, on making that successful. You alluded uh, there to some of the constraints with regard to transportation, particularly shipping, and and uh, uh, there being some you know difficulties in uh, maybe exporting and importing, and and this is going to be a my final question. There are a lot of small and medium-sized enterprises in this area that manufacture and export not only, well, they manufacture and distribute around our country, but they also export globally. Does the Fed provide any assistance in their endeavors, especially in the light of the pandemic, 
Um, if so, how, how do you encourage the export of goods from this area to other parts of the world? Yeah, we don't do anything directly in the Federal Reserve uh, around that. But, you know, one of our uh, things that we do that I think supports small and medium-sized enterprises of, of all types is uh, provide a lot of data and analytics around and, and, and reports on economic conditions and, and trends and things like that. So provide that information. I think, you know, it's very, very much, a, you know, we're a non-political, non-partisan uh, organization and really an expert um, chem driven organization. So our, I think the, one of our roles is to provide that kind of thought leadership and also, you know, more generally is trying to bring connect people and convene. So a lot of work that, you know, for economic development, community development to be successful, you have to bring a whole bunch of stakeholders together. It has to be the communities, the business, financial, you know, bankers uh, and, uh, and government together. And, you know, we have, I think, a very good standing. Uh, we're, we're not bringing money to the table necessarily, but we can bring expert, the experts together and the various stakeholders to work together on those issues and, and see how all the pieces fit together. I think often the, one of the challenges in economic development is that, uh, you know, people have great ideas or a lot of energy or, or, or focus on things, but you have to connect a whole bunch of things. And, you know, it, uh, one of the things in community development we talk a, a lot about, it's not just about jobs, it's not just about housing, not just about transportation, um, it's not just about health, it's about having all of those come together to have really a healthy community. So there, there I see is, is really our role is in the convening and, and connecting and, and bringing together, hopefully, uh, you know, the best uh, thought leadership. Thank you. Um, I, I have had a pleasure uh, asking my questions. Um, we're going to open it up. We have some Q&A questions that are coming in from our, our audience. And uh, the first question that I he have here is from an SU alum, Brett Genzer. And his question is the following. The, the Fed Board of Governors recently decided not to extend the change to the supplementary leverage ratio, SLR, that was put in place due to the COVID pandemic. So this has allowed banks to increase their balance sheets, provide more credit to businesses. How do you think banks, both large and smaller community banks in the central New York area, will have to adapt to the expiration of this SLR change? Um, and I appreciate going immediately to acronyms because I live in a world where we only speak in acronyms. <laughs> Thank you <laughs> on the SLR. Um, the, uh, and that's a great question because it really takes me back to, to March of, of last year, which was obviously extremely stressful uh, period for, pe for people uh, with the pandemic, with the health crisis, but then uh, the panic that was starting to set in, in in financial markets around the world. And so what you saw the Federal Reserve do and, and other uh, agencies along with uh, Congress um, and the administration was act very decisively and quickly to, I think, um, to ac accomplish a lot of things. But when I go to the SLR and some of the other things was really to make sure that uh, the regulations that were in place that were appropriate in normal times to make sure that the banking system was strong and could serve uh, the economy and, and the public, that these regulations in a moment of extreme stress that was driven by the pandemic, not about issues in the banking system, but this stress was coming in, but these regulations were not somehow, some way uh, impeding the flow of credit to households and businesses. And so one of the concerns with the enormous, um, you know, uh, basically uh, enormous volatility in the treasury market with the Federal Reserve acting decisively to bring, uh, you know, uh, in in liquidity into that market through our purchases is to make sure that various uh, types of regulatory or other issues weren't interfering with the success of those measures. And so there was the temporary relaxation of, of certain uh, regulations that were not really fundamentally directly about safety and soundness, but were more about uh, the, you know, kind of the effects on the treasury market. Um, and also, you know, in other uh, dimensions, but those were all designed to deal with a, you know, a severe disruption in markets. Now, fortunately, our actions and the actions of other central banks around the world and, and importantly Congress uh, was able to bring um, calm back to the markets uh, and you know normal functioning which we've you know had for the last year and as market functioning is returned to normal 
um, in terms of uh, treasury markets and markets like that. You know, we've seen various emergency uh, measures that the Fed and others took uh, have expired or or no longer being used. And so I see the SLR, it's not a decision I'm involved in, that's a board governor's decision. I should be very clear, I'm just uh, kind of opining on how I view it um, from the outside. But that, uh, that, you know, that was not, you know, uh, that was an emergency kind of step that was really helpful, I believe, last um, spring and summer, uh, but really wasn't uh, import, uh, needed now. Now, in terms of the question is, well, well, wait a minute now, well, what will the banks do? They have a, you know, the the the, the pre-pandemic regulatory regime is, is is in place. And, you know, my view there is the banks are, again, really well capitalized with ample liquidity. We're not seeing any signs of stress or disruption in these markets. And so clearly this um, at one aspect of the regulations is not you know, interfering with uh, financial markets intermediating in, in the flow of credit. Um, uh, so I don't, I'm not really concerned about that. Banks are, you know, still very strong. Fortunately, they pr pr prepared for this kind of event and, and they've, um, you know, come through it uh, pretty well. So I don't see this as being a particular challenge at, at, at this time. But I should make a more you know, general point about that, you know, the, the financial market stresses that we saw that were so acute in March, um, those have, uh, you know, uh, calmed and we've seen markets function really well. But I, I just don't want to lose track of the fact that the economy itself, the jobs, the employment, those still have a long ways to go before we're back to maximum employment or, or I think a, why, a ways to go do we get to a sustained 2% inflation rate and, and, and this moderately above 2% for some time that we talked about earlier. So separate out some of the emergency measures that we and others took to deal with the uh, extraordinary stresses and disruptions we saw in markets a year ago from the, the economic issues that we're dealing with today, which is really about jobs and, and, and inflation. And that, that provides a great segue to the next question. This question is from a colleague here, uh, Professor Fatma Sanmez Leopold. And uh, she actually has two questions, but I'll give you them separately because they're, they're distinct from one from another. Uh, um, you, you talked about what the Fed does in terms of monetary policy. You also talked about how Congress stepped in to help with fiscal policy during the course of the past year. If we go back to the global financial crisis of a decade ago, um, it didn't seem like there was a lot, uh, even with help from the Fed, that led to inflation picking up uh, right after the global financial crisis. Why do we think that this time, with monetary policy and monetary help from the Fed and fiscal help from Congress, that inflation is likely to be pushed up uh, in the you know, near future? So in other words, um, uh, a decade ago, even with quantitative easing, we still didn't seem to get much inflation. Now we're almost hoping for 2% inflation. Why do you think it will work this time when it didn't last? Yeah, and I, I think it's a, it's a great point. And having been a policymaker for that whole decade, uh, you know, I, I, we were thinking there might be more inflation after the global financial crisis with the extraordinary measures that we uh, took, undertook and other central banks did. Uh, and inflation stay, stayed um, very low um, uh, throughout that period. And, you know, I only reached our 2% goal uh, for uh, a, a brief time twice. Um, and so I think one of the lessons from that is inflate, the behavior of inflation is different than it used to be. It's so, um, and we have to understand the importance, you know, stay focused on the importance of achieving that sustained 2% inflation, this average 2% over time, anchoring inflation uh, expectations in, 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 at that 2% level uh, and not, you know, having inflation underrun the, the goal for a long time. So. Why do I have uh, more confidence? Uh, I guess is the question of this time that we'll be able to achieve that. Well, I do think it's the, the fiscal, you know, a couple things. One, this is a very different um, source of a downturn, very different recovery. Uh, the recovery from the financial crisis, like financial crises of, of, of the last hundred years, there's been a lot of research in that. Typically, following a financial or banking crisis, uh, econo economies get hit very hard. It takes a long time to get back to full strength. This situation is very different. 
it is much more of a closure for health reasons and a reopening as it's safe to do so. So I expect the economy will, as I said earlier, eventually get back to full strength and probably hopefully not have as much lasting uh, damage that, uh, as it, we saw in the global financial crisis. So I think that's one difference. I do think the fiscal policy is a huge um, mm-hmm. uh, a huge factor too. I mean, this is extraordinary by any measure. I mean, I've been following, I started taking economics classes in 1980. So I hate to think about how long ago that was, but you know, in, our, in, in that period of time, uh, you know, we've not seen this kind of uh, uh, fiscal uh, interventions starting mm-hmm. with March with the CARES Act a year ago which happened, I think, on March 27th, of my memory serves me right, was passed. So really within weeks of the, the kind of the onset of, of mm-hmm. the severe uh, stresses in the markets. And then we've seen, uh, again, recently, a, an additional sizable uh, government action. And I think that that has helped very, all those actions taken together have helped bridge, us, bridge families, businesses, and governments through uh, this period and put us in a situation where we're gonna see a very robust recovery, especially with the progress in the vaccinations. And, you know, assuming that all goes well, there's still things that might, you know, things that keep me up at night, including the new strains of the virus and, and you know, what's happening around the world with the struggles about containing COVID. But you know, I think that you know, we do see positive signs uh, of, an, of an economy that's able to recover much more strongly. And then we at the Fed are committed to again with our maximum employment kind of uh, focus is to not preemptively slow the economy because we think the economy is getting too strong uh, and worried about inflation taking off. We actually want to make sure we see the economy reach that strong point, see inflation reach the two percent, and and as we've said on track to to moderately exceed that uh, for some time. So this is I think there's a bunch of things coming together. It's a very different shock enormous fiscal support. And third is our policy strategy now, I think has um, taken on the lessons of the previous decade mm-hmm. and uh, has set us up to uh, to do uh, better, you know, succeed uh, in our goals uh, in this situation. Thank you. Um, the, the second question that I have from Professor Sonmans Leopold is uh, back to kind of the perspective of who the Fed are and what they do, and in particular, what the Federal Reserve Bank of New York does. So compared to the other 11 districts, the other 11 Federal Reserve Banks, what would you say, uh, relatively speaking, are our district's strengths and weaknesses, and how do they incorporate the Fed's overall monetary decisions? The, the strengths and weaknesses within our district, is that what you were asking about? The, the strengths and weaknesses of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York relative to other, other Feds. Yeah, no, it's, you know, and this is why the federated system actually serves us really well. I mm-hmm. mean, clearly we have, as, as was pointed out in, in earlier, was we have, you know, we are the center of financial markets in the U.S. and, and the world. So the New York Fed is very focused uh, on uh, you know what's happening in financial markets in, in the U.S. and around the world, and that, and that is one of since the founding of the New York Fed in 1913 and opening operations in 1914. I mean that's what you know that's that's been our, our critical role. We have a you know large group of people who that's their job. We also supervise the largest you know m- many of the uh, you know largest banks in in the country and in and, and in the world. Uh, and uh, and supervise other you know, critical parts of the uh, financial system infrastructure. So we have some unique responsibilities because of the role of New York uh, as a financial center in the world um, that are just different than most um, other reserve banks. Uh, so those are areas that we have you know, very deep uh, uh, knowledge, uh, a lot of expertise um, and a lot of experience that really serves us well. So what, what do we not have as much uh, compared to uh, my colleagues? Well, um, you know, if you go to the Dal- Dallas region or the Kansas City region, you definitely, they have a lot more community banks in, in, in that region. So the community banks are the smaller, more local um, banks. It's, you know, really important for uh, financing businesses and, and uh, their communities. So that, that's a, they have a lot more experience and knowledge in, uh, in that area. And we learn from them. And we obviously have community banks in our district as well. So, um, but that's uh, something that other, ba- other districts uh, have a, you know, a greater uh, focus on that and a greater experience in some of those areas. So again, with the federated system, you know, we have some unique roles and responsibilities, definitely, because we're in the financial markets, but you know, a lot of the things that we do, um, you know, are common to others, where, but other, my colleagues in other districts, uh, you know, have perhaps more of, of those activities. I will say one thing that's changed that's really interesting, it's definitely true of this area, um, uh, Central New York, 
is it, you know, coming from uh, the San Francisco Fed, you know, you might not be surprised. We thought uh, that was the center of all innovation in fintech. Uh, <laughs> but uh, and uh, that I think that was true for a long time. Obviously, there was has been a lot of innovation in Silicon Valley in, in the offshoots of that. Uh, but we are seeing a lot of innovation in fintech activity now. Uh, in the New York region, the, in the Northeast more generally. So uh, that's an area that I, you know, the San Francisco Fed, that, you know, clearly there's a lot of focus on that, uh, but we also are very uh, focused on that as, as that becomes a bigger part of the, um, the kind of the financial system or fin financial services uh, landscape. I have a question here from a member of the audience. I'm not sure of their affiliation. Jonathan Murray asks, after acquiring an ample vaccination level across the U.S., in other words, once people have, have become vaccinated and, and we're getting back into the, the swing of things and um, uh, the economy nationwide is, is doing well again. And I think this, this question you may have really answered already. Would, would the Fed raise rates with the economy coming back full swing? Um, let me ask you a part two. Okay. Will will quantitative easing still be a strategy used by the Fed when we get to those circumstances? Yeah, so those I mean those are uh, highly uh, you know relevant questions, and we've talked I talked a little bit about them, but I'll, I'll address them uh, specifically. You know, we are focused on achieving our our goal maximum employment price stability goals. We have set out very clear thresholds in terms of raising interest rates, a pretty high standard of achieving both levels of employment consistent with maximum employment. So being in levels, we say this is this is a really strong, healthy uh, labor market, and 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 you based on a, a broad set of measures. Again, not just looking at the, the one the unemployment rate, and also the this you know these uh, different tests in terms of achieving the two percent inflation, but also uh, uh, you know on track uh, looking ahead to moderately exceed that for some time. And then on the on the asset purchases. Uh, the quantitative easing part, uh, you know, we've set a, a, a high standard there in terms of, you know, we want to see um, a substantial progress on the on these goals before we, we modify uh, or, or, or change what we're doing uh, on, on those. So we've definitely put out pretty, I think, pretty clear markers. I will tell you that commentators are always wanting a little bit more clarity. What exactly do those words mean? But we put out pretty clear markers in that and they reflect going back to our strategy from last August uh, or last summer that we rolled out, that it really, this commitment to maximum employment um, and the word maximum and, you know, uh, and really making sure that we ch achieve that 2% average inflation rate uh, and on a sustained basis. And, and so that's driving the thinking uh, around uh, policy actions. I, I'll take the second part of the question to, to, to kind of more general. Um, is that, you know, a lot of people talk about unconventional monetary policy and they, they think about these asset purchases where we're, for, for those who don't follow this closely, it's where we're buying U.S. US government uh, bonds and, and notes, you know, U.S. Treasury securities and mortgage-backed securities uh, and buying them in the open market, going in there and competing against others. And that helps push those uh, prices up and lowers interest rates, which does spill over into lower mortgage rates, lower car loan rates, lower rates for businesses to borrow. So that's one of our tools that we started using in the financial crisis back in uh, end of 08 and, and, and continue to use. And we, we've been using it pretty actively uh, during this period. I don't think of that as unconventional anymore in a world of very low, globally low interest rates for the past couple of decades, interest rates have been very low, even in strong economies. I think that you know, conventional, what was unconventional uh, becomes just part of the toolkit. And, and the, the key parts of the toolkit that when we entered into the pandemic from all the experience of the financial crisis, from the experience in countries like uh, Japan and the European Central Bank and others is that you know, in addition to short-term interest rates, the Fed funds rate that we target at the FOMC, that using our balance sheet, using forward guidance, which is you know, communicating about what are the conditions under which we would adjust our policy, all of these can mutually support each other in providing a strong um, support uh, for, uh, for the economic recovery. Uh, so those are tools that we had studied a lot. We knew these were the tools in our toolkit for monetary policy. And I think those were, you know, we'll use them as appropriate. We go back to that appropriate word. We'll use them as appropriate, but they're definitely the tools that are there uh, uh, for, depending on this, the situation as needed. So I would just cross off it for all those who teach 
uh, econ 101, or especially uh, money and banking, maybe cross off the word un from, and from unconventional when it comes to <laughs> asset purchases and, and, and forward guidance communications. Uh, we're, we're rapidly approaching our hour, and I want to make sure that we have enough time for our um, uh, guest, uh, President Crable from, from OCC, to actually close. But I'm going to ask one final question, and I, I have to apologize to any uh, who have submitted questions that, that we haven't had time to ask. But uh, this question is from my department chair, so I'm a little biased. Um, uh, Professor Ravi Shukla asks, what are your thoughts on cryptocurrency? <laughs> it's always the last question that's the most controversial. It's, it's almost like a, 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 a law of, of, uh, of uh, sessions like this. So, you know, I, I'll, I'll give my one minute version. I know we don't have much time. Can I also just say thank you so much for all the students with the terrific questions, faculty with great questions. I really appreciate this opportunity uh, to be with all of you uh, today. Um, and uh, look forward to you know uh, uh, visiting Central uh, New York and, and Syracuse uh, after the pandemic. Uh, in terms of cryptocurrencies, I think the technology, uh, in in some ways, is is going to be transformative to different types of um, you know financial uh, services. Uh, we're seeing lots of new ideas about how to use blockchain and and those technologies for doing things that you know more efficiently and better than were done before. So I think there's a lot of innovation and and, and uh, new ideas around that. In terms of cryptocurrencies themselves, I, I I do I don't think that they've met the test. If you go back to money and banking about a, a currency um, that you know which you really want to as a store of value and a medium of exchange, um, they're they're you know, acting more like um, your know, assets of where the price moves a lot. And, you know, and from a point of view of the, of the public mission of the Fed, obviously we want to make sure our financial system is, is, um, is on a sound basis, but also that we're following all the, uh, the laws and, and regulations around and a money laundering, uh, terrorism, finance, and things like that. And so we need to have a payment system and a financial system that is, uh, you know, can be can make sure that there isn't criminal or other uh, activity going on using that. And so when it comes to a lot of these digital technologies and new ideas, I mean, that's one of the things we have to hold them to the same high standard that we hold banks and other financial institutions to make sure that these aren't being used for, uh, you know, uh, inappropriate purposes like uh, money laundering or or financing uh, terrorism and things like that. So that's one of the things that I think that still needs to be taken into consideration. I will say that in the world of digital currencies and all of that, this is probably one of the most exciting areas of, of research and study around the world right now to see how do we kind of you know move away from a paper more move somewhat away from paper currency to a much more efficient um, uh, you know, um, uh, digital kind of payment systems and something that that is, you know, very involved in. We're introducing a new uh, uh, real-time gross settlement payment system uh, to hopefully make uh, retail payments that consumers do uh, uh, cheaper, easier, uh, and uh, follow all those kind of principles that I mentioned. So with that, again, thank you very much. Thank you, John. Uh, we really appreciate you being here. I'm just going to uh, thank very quickly a few other people, and then I will give the last word to President Crable. Uh, um, let me thank uh, Dean Anderson for introducing Chancellor Severo. Thank you both for being here and for your presence. I want to thank some people from behind the scenes, uh, particularly Kevin Bailey, Don McWilliams, and also uh, Mike Cameron, who have been instrumental in putting this whole event together, and your own staff from the Fed who have uh, communicated very much with us for the past six weeks or so in preparing for this event. Uh, I want to just introduce uh, and, and hand, the, hand over the, the final words to um, uh, Dr. Casey Crable, the eighth president of Onondaga Community College, and we will leave... Um, uh, those final words with you, Dr. Crable. Thanks so much, Tom. And President Williams, thank you so much for being with us today. It's been amazing to hear directly from you and you've provoked uh, some great questions. Um, I got really scared when we got to cryptocurrency, but I feel better now. So thank, thank you for that. Um, I appreciated your sense of optimism for where we are and where we're going. And I also really valued your recognition to us that we can expect some unevenness as we move to what people are calling the next normal. 
Um, I want to thank Chancellor Severud and all of our colleagues at Syracuse University for their partnership in today's event and to the many things that we do together on a daily basis. I think it's really, um, if you've had conversations, President Williams, in this region, you know that there is a strong collaborative spirit and that certainly exists between and among institutions. And I think it's one of the things that makes Central New York special. Um, in that vein, I just wanna close by recognizing what's been our good connection um, with the Fed over time, and that is in your role in economic and community development. We so appreciate uh, your strong interest in leadership in examining workforce development issues in that role that you spoke of as a convener, helping us leverage connections that can make workforce development stronger and really get us to that point that you talked about, about maximum employment. You've been a great partner. Um, you've shown that by being here today, uh, and we thank you very much.